Welcome to the Behind the Bits podcast. Your host, Scott Curtis, wants to learn everything he can about stand-up comedy and take you along for the ride. Scott and his guests talk serious about comedy in every episode. Behind the Bits will uncover knowledge from different perspectives on subjects such as writing and performing stand-up comedy, as well as booking shows and the comedy life. If you're thinking about becoming a stand-up comic, already in the comic game, or a comedy nerd, Behind the Bits is the show for you. Now, let's get Behind the Bits. Okay. All right. Welcome back to the Behind the Bits podcast. I'm still Scott Curtis, and I've got Mark Masters with me here today. How are you, Mark? I'm doing great, Scott. Thanks for having me. I got to tell you, um, you know, I'm really glad I uh, jumped on Reddit when I did, because that was the only way I was going to find you. And I found you. I immediately bought your audio book for not good yet i'm holding it up here for you so you can see your own book um and then uh you sent me the the um print copy because i like the audio book so much but um i couldn't keep rewinding and finding all the stuff that i wanted to highlight so i got that and i've i've marked it up pretty good and um i was absolutely blown away by your book and i wanted so much to have this when i first started doing stand-up I think that every comedy club should just buy a box of these. And when they do a open mic, um, they should just uh, uh, give them to the open micers and it'll alleviate like 80% of their problems. (laughs) So so it's, it was inspirational. Everything was, I mean, this was about the perfect book for a new comic to read. Oh, that's great to hear. That's, that was one of my goals was to make it easier for comics to, uh, decide if they wanted to pursue stand up comedy and what to do as their beginning. So that's awesome. That's high praise. Thanks a lot, Scott. Yeah, it was, uh, it was, it was, it just clicks so many boxes for me and, you know, having been doing this for five years and I would say I probably put a good solid, year and a half of actual work into that five years uh you know i didn't do i didn't do your marathon thing but you know it's been an off and on thing for me everything you said was just right it it, it was it was just i've experienced it all i've seen it i've made the mistakes that that you can make and it was just absolutely the 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 best thing in the world so i just wish i would have mm-hmm. read it before i started uh, doing uh the open mics because I would have been so much better at it. <laughs> yeah. There are, there are not a lot, there are not a ton of original ideas in there. There are things that people have experienced over the decades as open micers. Just, I'm not sure a lot of people have gone to the trouble of writing them down. Right. And, uh, one of the thing that's things that's fun for me as I'm approaching two years in comedy, that book is about my first six months and first 100 open mics. Uh, it's fun to realize that I could not write that book now. I'm a totally different person and comedian than I was a year and a half ago when I started writing the book about my first six months. Uh, You change so much in the beginning as a comedian. Uh, It's cool that I have a snap. It's also embarrassing. It's embarrassing and cool to have a snapshot of where I was six months in. And I hope it helps other comics. Yeah. And I, I am just, uh, uh, in a hundred percent agreement that, uh, you know, after, after two years, you're, you're a totally different person as a comic and, and you change as a person too. But I, uh, I was just, uh, I just read it and I was like, you know, this has got the perfect amount of, okay, this is what you do. This is your checklist. This is how you, how you act. This is when you show up along with enough personal stories in there to understand, you know, okay, this is, this is where Mark had a bad one and this is where Mark had a good one. And it just, it, I, it was so easy to listen to. And then, um, I read through it again. It was just one of those things that, um, you know, 
the listen was probably two or three sessions because I drive a lot and um, uh, reading it through. I think I read it through in two nights again. So, you know, it yeah. was just, did you just, listen to it on Audible or how did you get it? Yeah, I did um, Audible. Um, OK. And you it's narrate your own Audible. Platforms for the listeners you, in the print version you can get in local bookstores around Colorado or on Amazon. or You can contact me and I'll probably mail you one if, if you're nice. Right. And I'm going to make sure that the uh, show notes have links for this too, uh, so that they can, they can get the book as well. Just, cool. just a great book. So let's, let's talk about how it all came about because, sure. um, you are not a born stand up comic. Um, no. you didn't, you didn't start super early in life. Um, no. so without giving the whole book away, um, how, you know, why I, yeah, well, I've always been like a lot of stand up uh, aspiring stand-up comics. I've always enjoyed stand-up comedy. Mm-hmm. I grew up on watching stand-up comedy and listening to cassette tapes of stand-up comedy. And uh, that I, ages you right there. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I'm an, I'm an older guy. I'm in my 40s. Uh, for those of you who are just listening to me and haven't seen my picture before, so I'm a little different around the open mic scenes. You know, most people are half my age. Uh, which is an advantage in some ways in comedy because I have a lot of life experience, a lot of stories I can draw upon, uh, which, which is exciting. Uh, but basically I, I was like a lot of, uh, starting comedians. It was a, it was a new year's resolution for me. It took me about six months to get around to, I, I decided at the end of one year, I wanted to do some fun and exciting things the next year. And one of them was to do an open mic. Mm-hmm. Uh, for stand-up comedy. I, I'd been to a few open mics over two decades, uh, mostly in Los Angeles, just uh, kind of curious about how comedy works uh, behind the scenes. And I thought I could give it a try. And uh, it was it was not great, my first open mic. And it was very scary, as, as many people can relate to. Uh, I have friends who have reached out to me since who want to do an open mic. And I'm like, no problem. You name the day of the week. I'll meet you. I'll make sure it's easy for you. And then like three, four weeks will go by and they're like, you know what? I'm not going to do it. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> I changed my mind. Yeah. So it's a little, it's a little, uh, I, I, I write about this in the book, but I remember the, about a week before I did my first open mic, I went to an open mic to watch it in Denver. This was at three Kings, a Friday afternoon mic. And I was like literally sick to my stomach mm-hmm. watching the other comedians. Like if they did well, I felt bad because I was like, I could never be that funny. And if they did poorly, I felt bad because I thought that's going to be me in about a week. Uh-huh. And it just, it made me physically sick to my stomach uh, while I was standing there. And I think of that every time I go to that mic, Nathan Lund, who's a terrific comedian in Denver, runs that open mic. And I, I, every time I'm there and now I have a little bit more confidence and generally don't feel nervous going up at that mic, but it's, it's one of the scarier mics in Denver in the sense that there's just, you know, not always a very receptive audience Mm. at that open mic. So it's a little, uh, scary. Yeah. When you were, uh, listening to those cassettes, who did you, uh, who did you listen to that really, really, um, got you interested and say, said, Hey, I want to do that. Yeah. Well, what's funny is uh, probably the most influential cassettes were Monty Python cassettes, oh, which yeah. aren't even really stand up comedy. It's more sketch comedy, but mm. I love those uh, cassettes, listening to those songs and the cheese shop sketch. And mm. uh, it's just so funny. Uh, Eddie Murphy was, was big when I was growing up. Mm. Um, I can still remember him imitating his grandmother and the thermostat. And uh, I really, I really enjoyed his comedy. So Mm -hmm. Eddie Murphy and Monty Python, very different (laughs) two ends of the spectrum. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, Those are cassette. That's how cassette tapes were. You didn't have unlimited access to anything. You just kind of had, (laughs) had what you had. That's all you could listen to. So I had some Monty Python tapes and some Eddie Murphy tapes. And Uh that's what I listened to. (laughs) I grew up on Monty Python too. And I had a um, I had a really scary thing happen. I uh, when my son my son he's twenty six years old now, but when he was still living at home and he was getting into teenage years, I uh, 
showed him um this is spinal tap the movie yeah and it's one of my favorite movies and he was watching it and he said dad i hate this he he said oh. i i do not like this movie so we shut it off and then i uh i didn't i didn't recommend any movies to him for a while but then a couple years later i got monty python and the holy grail on dvd and had him watch it and he fell in love and i was like okay you know uh, you really are my son and um uh, he he wanted the the special edition for christmas and all that kind of stuff so i can definitely dig the monty python yeah there, there's some of those sketches are ageless it's mm. incredible they're so funny i really liked uh john cleese did a um show called faulty towers after that and that's one another one of my favorites I'll have to check that out. I haven't seen it. Oh, it's really good. Yeah, I think uh, I think it's on Netflix. Um, okay. If not, it's on one of the BBC things. But yeah, it's 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 really good. So you're doing. Um, you decide you're going to do this, and you come from you know a non comedy background. And did you tell anybody you're going to do this? Not really. Um, I mean, uh, some very close friends knew, uh, but it wasn't something that I like broadcasted. Like I didn't invite people to my first open mic, Mm -hmm. which I'm relieved about now. Uh, when I, about six months in, I got my first stage time at comedy works, which is the big famous club in Denver. Uh, and I invited some friends to that, Mm -hmm. but, uh, at the very beginning, no, no, I was, I was, uh, I didn't know that I would stick with it. I didn't know it'd be so fun and engaging. Mm-hmm. Uh, after I did it two, three times, like, you know, I, I go out as many nights a week as I can and uh, really, really enjoy it mm-hmm. to a level where many of my friends just don't understand yeah. <laughs> why, why I would sit at a bar at, you know, 11 p.m. midnight, wait two hours for three minutes of stage time. Mm-hmm. It's it's it can be hard to explain to what some people call civilians right. non comics. Yeah, you um you put more effort into it than I think I ever will. Um I mean you really when you decided to do it, you decided to do it. You would you would stay up all night um waiting to get that three minutes and you know, I read in the book, you know, sometimes you had to get up at six in the morning to catch a plane, um, for something. And, um, you know, I, I admire that because I, well, and I started out at a a later time than you, I, I, I can't stay up that late anymore. (laughs) It's hard. It's hard. And it's funny. I I record all my sets. I audio Mm -hmm. record all of them. I video record here and there. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I listen to all of them as well. And, I, I can always tell a difference. Like even if, if somebody just played them randomly for me, I could tell you about what time of night it was Yeah, because some, some mics are like five, 6 PM and I sound great and high energy and excited. And, and some mics it's, it's one in the morning and I sound, I just sound miserable. Like the material's funny, but I sound, I don't know. There's something in my voice that is just very tired. Yeah. It's something that I've learned over time. I can kind of fake that for a few minutes when I get on stage now to like sound like it's 6 p.m. instead of one in the morning. Mm -hmm. Because I didn't realize in the beginning that if I wasn't intentional about my my voice, that I would sound like I was falling asleep and just like bored with what I was doing, which was not the case at all. It was just I was physically exhausted. Mm -hmm. And I I I respect that. And um it makes you respect the comics that have to travel. Cause I, I have done some shows that are, um, relatively far away, you know, a couple hours, two, two and a half hours and just a mic, just an open mic, um, because I wanted to get out of town and see what, it, what my material was like there. And, you know, it's a long drive there. It's a long drive back. And you think about these comics that tour and, you know, they may they may have their last show at ten or eleven o'clock at night, but then they got to get up in the morning. They got to do radio. They got to they got to travel to the next place. Sometimes they're driving. Sometimes they're flying. So you really got to respect that. And if that's the life that you're looking for, you got to understand that there's going to be um, some times of no sleep. Yeah. It's, it's tough. The, the one funny thing, I've had a lot of conversations with other comics about this. I used to hate to drive 
And now I actually like driving because I can think about my material. Sometimes I'll record myself Mm. doing bits and then listen back to them and analyze them and improve them. And I'll listen to comedy podcasts like yours or uh, audiobooks about comedy or comedy albums. And now it's to the point where I, I used to not like driving. Now, if somebody was like, hey, will you go pick up this thing for me 45 minutes away? I, w- I would hop at that opportunity because mm. <laughs> for whatever reason, I really like being in the car now. Right. Yeah. I, I, I'm the same way. I, I enjoy the drive and I've changed from, you know, just listening to music all the time. The same as you podcast, uh, audio books, comedy albums, all the, the whole, the whole gamut, just because you draw inspiration from it and, and you always get a good, uh, good nugget of, uh, advice out of just about everything you hear. So it's, it really helps. I wanted to, um, touch base a little bit on the, um, on the recording aspect, because yeah. when I first started, somebody told me a couple of people said, Hey, you got to record yourself all the time. And yeah. I didn't listen to them and I wish I would have. And now I'm like you, I, I get an audio recording of everything. And I, I video, um, usually when my wife's with me, I have her do the video for me cause she's heard it all before anyway. And, um, and, uh, discuss the importance of that and what you do with it after you're done, because it's one thing to say, okay, record everything, but what do you do with that recording when you're done with it? Yeah. One, well, let me work backwards here. One of the newer, more advanced things I'm doing with the recordings, which, which I think is interesting is when I listen back to them, I now track all my open mics in a spreadsheet where I actually write down what material I perform. So anywhere from five to 15 items for a, for a three to five minute set, it mm-hmm. could be one liners or bits that I'm working on. And what I do with that is when I go back to that mic again, like it might be a week later, I will look at what I performed the last two, three weeks and just make sure I don't repeat material immediately. Mm-hmm. Like I, ne- I never, now that I'm a little more organized, I never want to go to the same open mic if it's every Wednesday, let's say, and perform the same material week after week, Mm -hmm. you know, I I want at least maybe like a month, six weeks spread. Now that I also have the luxury of having more material in the beginning, you don't have any material. So, you know, you're doing the same stuff all the time, but now I have enough, you know, 30, 45 minutes of material. I can kind of spread it around. And I always want to do my new stuff and work on it, but it it just, you know, I don't want to, there are a couple reasons for doing that. One is basically out of courtesy to the other comedians who are there. Maybe somebody has Wednesday nights off work and they're always at the Wednesday night mic. They're a comic. They don't want to hear me do the same stuff that I did last Wednesday. Uh, right. So I try and cycle the material. So that's, that's one thing I, I do with it. Um, because you now you might say, well, why don't you just write a set list before you go up to the mic and then uh, use that and you don't need the recording. Well, the reality is I've learned you change when you get up on stage. I, I do often write a set list before I get up at an open mic. But I might riff about something that happened in the room. I might tell a joke about candy and it goes really well. And then an audience member will yell out another kind of candy and I'll have a joke about that candy and I'll just completely change what I'm doing on mm-hmm. stage. And so then I need the recording to go back and, and remember what I did. And often I'll be when I finish one mic, I'll hang out for a couple comics and then go try and hit another mic in the same night. And that's an advantage of being in a big city like Denver, which Mm. has an amazing comedy scene. Uh, And and thank you so much to all the hosts of open mics everywhere. Like I couldn't (laughs) be more grateful for people who like, I complain a little bit about having to sit through a bunch of open mic comedy to get up and do my material. Imagine how difficult it is for the host of the open mic who has to sit there the entire time, be it, two hours or, or in some cases like six hours yeah. of open mic comedy. It's incredible. So thank you. If you're an open <laughs> open mic host listening to this or might become an open mic host, thank you for doing that. Uh, the other thing I listen for are things that I can improve on and things that I, that I did well. Uh, a good example of calling back to what I said earlier was how my voice sounded tired. And now I intentionally remind myself to have some energy in my voice. Like, Every comic's different. Some people are more deadpan, like an Anthony Jesselneck. He kind of always sounds low energy, mm-hmm. but that's not really my 
I'm, I'm a little higher energy guy and I'm on stage. I, I have a little bit of energy and I'm, and I'm happy to be there is the, is the idea I'm trying to communicate, but that doesn't always come across if I'm really tired. Mm. Uh, sometimes I miss words. A, a good example of that is the other day I, I did a theater. It was an open mic, but it's a theater show, uh, in Denver, uh, where you, if you arrive early enough, you can sign up and get up at a theater and there's like 50 audience members. So it's great opportunity to get some stage time. What surprised me at this theater was that you could not see the audience. Mm. Uh, the lights were so bright. There were 50 to 75 people in the audience. But I couldn't see a single person. It was just like blinding white light. Mm. And it scared me because I'm, you know, I'm still a, a year and a half to two years in. I'm not, you know, I'm not touring around the country regularly or, or have a lot of stage experience. So that was maybe the third or fourth time in my life that I'd performed without being able to see the audience. And I was scared. So I think I was a little nervous. And a joke of mine, a, a bit I have about Valentine's Day didn't hit the way I expected it to. And it wasn't until I listened to the recording the next day that I realized in the beginning, uh, I said the word Kit Kat instead of Twix, uh-huh. which I have no idea why. The whole joke <laughs> is about Twix. I, I don't know why I said Kit Kat. It was just like a, a mental mistake. And uh, but that explains why later in the joke, it didn't like the joke just doesn't make sense when I say the wrong word. Yeah. Uh, and that's that's a unique situation. That doesn't happen that often that I slip up on a detail like that and don't know it in real time. But that was an example where I remember thinking, boy, that joke has done a lot better for less people. There are a lot of people in this audience, a lot of people here. Why are they not laughing like they did at the two bits before it? Mm-hmm. And then later I found out that I, I made a mistake uh, in the delivery. So that's another reason to listen um, sometimes just the act of listening to me tell material will make me think of tags the same way. You, like when I watch other open mic comedians, sometimes I'll be like, Oh, it'd be funny if you went down this path. Mm-hmm. And sometimes just listening, there's something different about writing out jokes and verbally expressing jokes and then listening back to the jokes. Sometimes I'll think of funny words that I can add into an existing joke. There's just like I could go on for probably half an hour about I could write a whole book about the benefits of listening to your sets. And it just amplifies when you watch yourself on stage. Right. Uh, just real quick to go into video analysis, like just watching yourself, even with the volume off is interesting. Like I've noticed a lot of things I do that is not good. Most recently, um, I, I used to be a mic out of the stand person. Mm-hmm. And in the last few months, I've been experimenting, with leaving the mic in the stand. And I noticed something on video recently that I do, which I don't like, which is basically I leave my hands close to where my pockets are and very still for up, upwards of a minute. Uh-huh. And it just looks super awkward. And I don't notice it on stage, but watching the video, I've realized, oh, I need to be a little more animated with my hands and uh, move their position more frequently. Mm. So, very long. Yet. Great question. Got, got me very excited. Yeah. And that's, that's something that really didn't, uh, it didn't sink in with me for a while. And now um, I've actually gotten to the point where I've got a separate audio recorder instead of using my phone. And the reason why is because it's real easy to plug into my computer with USB and I can just take it, I can take it out and um, I'm not filling up my phone and all that kind of stuff. But I also use that because I seem to get probably 70% of my ideas while I'm driving. And um, if I'm driving, I can mute my phone, pull pull that up and say, yeah. here's the premise, you know, dogs or whatever. And then th- then I don't forget it and uh, I can I can go on with my day. So, yeah, it's it's so important and it's hard at first. It's really hard to listen to yourself, to watch yourself because you you hate your own voice um, and everybody does. And you you don't like what you said. All you can all you can hear is the mistakes. And um, but. Well, that's what well, makes you better. Yeah, but you have to listen for the laughter too. I mean, if somebody's laughing yeah. and you're and you're making mistakes, that's fine. And uh, yeah. it, it's so funny. I had a similar experience to you at that theater because I recently did a um, comedy competition in uh, Grand Rapids, and the uh, 
comedy club is the same. The lights are so strong, and I'm I'm six foot five, so I'm by the lights anyway. So the lights were so strong that I couldn't see anybody. I could see one guy in the front row, and I did the. Uh, a similar thing with a joke. I forgot the most important tag on the joke because the middle tag, it was a three tag joke. The middle tag got a lot more laughter than I'm used to. It's usually, it's usually a building thing and it got the laughter that the last tag normally gets. And I thought, okay, I'm done. And, uh, and I went on to the next joke. And when I sat down, uh, just my wife was with me. And right when I sat down, I'm like, oh man, i I, f- I forgot the fact that we don't front because that was my tag. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, man. And she says it's okay because the middle tag did fine. So, But you just know. You, yeah. As soon, as soon as you sit down and, you know, fortunately that's recorded and I can uh, look at that and say, well, let's not forget that tag again. Right. Yeah. yeah it's a good reminder. Yeah, I have a, a fun small story. I have a, a web series and podcast as well called Mark Masters. And I was interviewing a guy, Jake Hovis, who's a comedian out of Denver, who, uh, very funny guy. We did a show in Aspen together. Anyways, I was asking him about what he does with his recordings. And very interesting. He shares every open mic recording with his wife Uh the very next morning. And she provides feedback within a day or two. Mm -hmm. And so they have this like relationship where he's going out to open mics, recording his material and running it by his wife, who I think is a saint in that situation yep. for listening to all his material and providing feedback. And uh-huh. he said that he sometimes slips inside jokes just between his wife and him into his stand up material uh-huh. because he knows that she's going to eventually listen to the recording. Uh-huh. I thought that was, was very cute. That's and great. Yeah. My, I'd have to say my wife's kind of the same. I do almost exactly the same thing with my wife. And that's, that's uh, like a superpower. That's and, great. Yeah. And the fact that she's, she schleps around with me all the time. Uh, I mean, she will come live and see the same stuff that I did last week and the week before mm-hmm. and very supportive. And I appreciate that. That's awesome. Man. I love that's you, honey. Awesome, really. Terrific. <laughs> Maybe she's listening to podcasts. I, yes, I, I know yes, she listened to my last you're one. The best. Yeah. Thank you for doing that for Scott. <laughs> so one thing I uh, wanted to ask, in addition, that this was this was interesting in your book and um, something I haven't done, but once I read it, I thought, oh, gosh, it's stupid that I don't do it. Not only do you keep a good spreadsheet of your own stuff, but you take really good notes on the other comics. Can yeah, you, can you talk, I, about, I talk that? about that a lot in the book? I don't do that as much anymore, which okay. is interesting. Uh, like, again, saying I'm a different comedian than I was at the end of that six month period when I wrote the book. Uh, frankly, I don't have the same patience <laughs> that I used yeah. to have. And also I kind of in Denver, there's two to three hundred open mic comics and, and it, it ebbs and flows and, and new people come in and old people drop out. But there is a core of like, let's say, 200 comics that I know their face and their name at this point. I've seen them enough. Uh, and so also that there's not as much value in that. Mm-hmm. So it used to be, I was just trying to learn people's names and figure out uh, their material. Um, it's kind of fun too, because it, it can get boring to sit there for a long time. And it, it would be fun to figure out like, oh, this comic, you know, he watched a lot of Jar- George Carlin mm-hmm. or uh, this is a Jerry Seinfeld disciple or this guy really enjoys Jim Gaffigan yeah. humor or, or this guy even stole a jo- I can I remember this joke and it came from, you know, Steve Martin or whomever. It, mm-hmm. it was just a way to pass the time. Another thing in the Denver scene, which is a little different than many scenes, uh, not every open mic is run like a show up, go up mic where it goes in list order. Mm-hmm. And, and that might be a little bit too much vernacular for non comedians, but if you're an open mic comedian, you, you know what I'm talking about. And in certain open mics in Denver, they just kind of pick people at random order. And mm-hmm. the justification is that it's not random. They're really trying to present a good show. So that to try and keep regular audience members there, they'll have, they'll try and do a good comedian every few spots in between comedians that are newer and haven't quite figured it all out yet. Mm -hmm. And so now that I'm approaching two years in, I'm, I'm still not good yet, but I'm better than I was when I first started. Mm -hmm. So in the beginning, it was not uncommon to show up an hour early to a mic 
and still wait three hours after the mic started to get my three minutes of stage time because I was a nobody and not very funny. Uh, now, sometimes I'll show up 10 minutes before the mic. There are already 20 people there. And maybe I get up 45 minutes in or, or half an hour in mm-hmm. because, you know, they need somebody that they know will tell good jokes, which is which is good and bad. It's great for me because it's more time efficient and I can hit more mics. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, sometimes I feel pressure, though, to be funny and use material that I know works uh, when I really want to work on a joke that is brand new and I don't know if it's going to work. That is an excellent point. Um, I've, I've been caught in that, uh, in that conundrum several times. And just last night I did, I did the local mic here and instead of the normal crowd, a whole bunch of Notre Dame students piled in and the place was packed. It was standing room only. And guess what I did? I went back to tried and true and yeah, sure. I had some new stuff I wanted to try. And, and that all that does is delays your progress by a week. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, it's tricky. And, and you learn, like, now I can, usually I'll do a sandwich, right? I'll do something I know works, something new, mm-hmm. something I know works. Yeah. And if there's something, you, you also learn savers and stuff like that. Like, if there's something new doesn't work, you can almost get as big a laugh just by saying, hey, guys, this is open mic comedy. It's not all going to work. Yeah. You know, or you say something like that. And people will laugh just at that because it's very present and in the moment. And it's, it's, it, it as an audience member, it makes you feel like you're part of something special and not just hearing people read from a script. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with that. It's, uh, it, it's, it's hard when, when you're a comic and you have the chance to, uh, show your stuff to new people and just bring out the greatest hits. It's, it's hard not, it's hard not to latch onto that, but it's also important with that crowd that's never seen you to, pull out some of that new stuff and, and make, make sure that they hear that too. Yeah. Yeah. I would say for comedians getting started to, to kind of highlight what's in the book. So I would write down the name of every open mic comedian that went up before me and some kind of observation about their set. Uh, I like what they did with their hands during the set, mm. did something silly with the mic stand, uh, told a joke about video games. You know, maybe I hadn't ever heard a joke about video games combine jokes about food and I don't know, furniture, uh, just, you know, something about their set just to kind of keep myself engaged and present in the open mic. And just by taking those notes, I would learn a lot. And it was just a way for me to speed up my development as a comedian, right? Just by actively observing. Um, and I would also, one of the things that maybe I didn't do so well in the beginning, which everybody should be aware of as well, is it's important to network and meet the other comedians in your scene. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you can't have your face in a notebook the whole time, uh, which maybe I erred on the side of, of, of doing that a little too much. Um, and then on the other side, you can't really, you're not going to make best friends with all the comics the first week you show up right. at an open mic because, you know, frankly, people come and go at an alarming rate. And uh, comics don't want to invest much time in, in random strangers that may or may not be there in a mm, few weeks. Right. Now, do you consider yourself uh, an outgoing person? Or are you a bit of an introvert naturally? I, I'm an, I would say I'm an introvert. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, there are a lot of times and places in comedy. Like I produce shows and run shows and host them now. And you have to be outgoing, I think to run a good show. Mm. Like I try, you know, I, my, all my shows that I run, I want them to be regular, they're monthly shows and I want people to come back and and we get return visitors all the time. And I think part of the reason for that is I go out of my way before the show and after the show to go around and thank people for showing up, ask them where they came from, how they heard about the show, try and, you know, get more data that can help me improve the show. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that's, that's like, it's hard for me. It doesn't come naturally. I have to go out of my way yeah. to be outgoing like that. Uh, it I think a lot in my, of energy. my happy place is, you know, in a corner, <laughs> in a quiet room, yeah. writing jokes in a, in a notebook. Right. I don't necessarily want to be on stage or uh, be talking to a bunch of people. Uh, so, yeah. 
And that's part of the that, that's part of the fun of uh, doing stand up is it it breaks you through that and it uh, it forces you into that out at least for the time you're on stage you, you're forced into that outgoing posture and and uh, talking to people and I, I'm the same way I'm I'm uh, I'm an introvert but I've been in the business world for a long time so I have trained myself to act like an extrovert and and yeah. that early on you know i really i i really was meeting comics and talking to them i much prefer a one-on-one -on -one conversation with no small talk and just talking about what's important to us um but in a group i will force myself to talk a little bit it takes a ton of ton of energy and it's really um it's it's really a lot more difficult than people think it is but it definitely pays off because for a while there i kind of i kind of went into my shell and did that just put my head in my notebook and stopped talking to people and uh it, it you don't get anywhere that way yeah yeah i think that's a good a trained extrovert is what i am yeah and you, know, have... you use a lot of words that a lot of newer comics um i don't hear using so i know you come from probably some sort of a business background because you you use words like data um, and statistics and things like that. How do you think that your your previous life helped you get into comedy and become more successful more quickly? Uh, well, okay, that's a sure. I have become more successful more quickly than anybody else. But if I have had success, I can certainly uh, pinpoint areas where my past professional experience has definitely helped. Mm -hmm. Like just the fact that I'm, I'm savvy with how spreadsheets work, which is not like any kind of superpower. It's just, I've spent a lot of time in cubicles yeah. <laughs> over 20 years. Uh, I, I am good with spreadsheets. It's not something I advertise or I'm proud about, uh, but it's just something I've learned. And that that's helped me like tracking, you know, I run multiple shows now where I have to track, you know, who I'm paying, what I'm paying, you know, when they're showing up, the order of the person, you know, how you contact these people. Um, and so like just the kind of logistics or the uh, planning, I'm pretty good at that stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think that definitely helped help. It's certainly helped me in the show running. So I, I run the Vail comedy show, which is probably my premier show. It runs once a month in Vail, Colorado, with mm -hmm. Vail Brewing Company. If anybody takes a ski vacation, uh, <laughs> if you're planning three months ahead of time, send me a note and uh, I'll, I'll schedule the weekend around so you can see some amazing comedians. We get great touring comedians at the show and pack out this brewery. It's mm -hmm. really it's a special thing. We've made the front page of the newspaper there and uh, it's been very exciting. And I couldn't, I honestly, I, I probably couldn't have done that and been an open mic comedian without my past professional experience. Right. It's just like dealing with the venue uh, you know, communicating professionally, um, uh, you know, setting up things. I'm always trying to improve the show. Like I'm always adding new elements to the show, like different lighting or there's, there's a TV in the back of this showroom and I set up a camera on the stage last month and then put the video on the TV in the back. Mm -hmm. So that's just an example of, of something to try and just make the show better. Every month I try and add something new and make it better. So it's, you know, a lot of people who run shows, they just, you know, it's a, it's a mic and a speaker and a comedian. And that's great. Like the focus should be on great comedy. And I, and I try and book the funniest comedians, the best comedians I can, because that's what you want. But also an important element to shows is having a good captive audience that is excited to be there. Mm -hmm. And so I feel a responsibility to make an incredible environment for comedians so that those comics tell their friends you have, and this literally happened. Somebody came up to me and said, Hey, this other comedian told me that I have to get on the Vail comedy show. <laughs> How do I get on the Vail comedy show? And that just like warms my heart. Oh, I'm not, yeah. There's a whole chapter in my book, how I'm not on Facebook. Spoiler alert. I'm still not on Facebook. There's like a question mark kind of in the, in the book. If mm. I ever will get on Facebook, I'm almost two years in and I've, I've had a couple things happen recently resisting that i've never been on it in my whole life uh and that makes things difficult in, in certain ways but 
people, even not being on Facebook, when you do good things, people will hear about them. Mm -hmm. I don't even know how it happens, but people come up to me and say like, Hey man, I I saw you were on TV eight, uh, up in Vail doing the morning TV show. That's incredible. That was really cool. How, how do I, how can I become a part of that? Uh, and I didn't tell anybody that I'm not Uh on social media in any meaningful way. And I'm, I'm not on Facebook or Instagram somehow, you know, somebody else found a clip of it and shared it, or I don't even know how it happened. Mm. Uh, and, and it's, this works in the converse way as well. If you do bad stuff, <laughs> it's going to show up as well. Yeah. And luckily that, that hasn't happened to me, but you know, whether you're on social media or not, the point is that the good work you do will probably get out to other people. And that's what I focus on. Mm-hmm. I, whenever somebody quizzes me on why I'm not on Facebook, I'll usually ask them how much time, like I'll ask, are you on Facebook, Scott? Yeah. How much time do you think you spend a day on Facebook? I would say at least two hours. Yeah. Okay. So great. That's a great response. Some people say 30 minutes, which I think they're lying. Other people Uh, will say like four or five hours. Yeah. And I I just say, imagine if you spend all that time writing or trying to make your show better or whatever. And so anyway, to, to get back to your original question about how my professional past has helped my current comedy the, the shows that I think are better and exist because I had a professional past, uh, the benefit to me as a comedian is stage time. Mm-hmm. It is so competitive and difficult. In Denver, there, there are easily 150 comedians that are no question better than I am in Denver. So if somebody is trying to book a comic in Denver, there are 150 people who will basically do comedy for close to free because they're still open mic comedians. These aren't touring mm. you know, headliner kind of people. They're not past the comedy works, but they're all better than I am as a comedian. So it's very difficult to get stage time in, in the Denver, Colorado market where I am being a year and a half to two years in. Mm. So by organizing shows, I have, uh, you know, I get to do 10 minutes up top as a host and practice and, and get more experience being on stage. So that's, been very valuable for me. So that has helped me, I think, get more successful than I would have been without that past experience. Right. And, you know, I, I've talked about this a little bit before. Sometimes just the maturity of years helps a little yeah. bit too. Um, you know, you started, I think you said you started in the book you, when you were 42. Is that correct? Uh, we're losing each other. Yeah, we just a little bit. Um, All right, we're back. Yeah, right. Uh, yes, I was forty-two. Yeah. I'm not sure if you said anything after that, but I I started comedy at forty-two, which is a ripe old age. Right. So you um, you've had some life experience. Obviously, I started when I was fifty, so you know I'm a later bloomer than bloomer than even right. you. Um, I love to hear that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, there. I guess the thing is, is um, we've probably had some real things happen in our life. I mean, by, by the time I started, you know, I had, um, gone through some of my friends passing away. My best friend in high school passed away. I've had kids, um, you know, I've had great, great things and terrible things. And I guess it kind of centers you, um, when you start comedy, because, um, you can have the worst open mic ever and it ain't that big of a deal. I mean, you, you want to get better, but, uh, it, it certainly isn't the worst thing that's happened in your life. So you, you can move on from it when you're 22, you may not have experienced all that stuff. And the worst open mic of your life, uh, is the worst thing of your life at that point. Right. And, and, and that that's, I, I, I understand that. Um, but, um, uh, if I would have started at when I was 21 or 22, I probably would have quit because I couldn't, couldn't handle the disappointment. Right. Yeah. There's a discipline and a maturity that comes with age that helps. And, uh, you know, any comic, even, tw- even 17 year olds that are, that are in the Denver scene, some of them work very hard, you know, it, working hard is not, age specific. Right. There, there are young people that work hard and old people that work hard and there are old people that don't work hard. Uh, <laughs> but for sure, the comedians who put in the most energy and effort into the craft, uh, I see 
becoming better faster. Now yeah. there are some people with incredible talent and just great energy, but it's what well, has been a surprise to me that in comedy it's it, there's so much of it is the work you put in. Mm-hmm. Well, the funniest people are some of the hardest workers because they're constantly trying new material and writing new material and exploring different avenues and, you know, taking any stage time they can to get better. Uh, and that's not as it, I do feel like I'm good at that. Like I'm good at working hard and being disciplined, but I wouldn't necessarily say that that's only because I'm 40 something. Mm -hmm. Uh, there are, there's certainly some very young comics that work incredibly hard that I'm very impressed with. And the sacrifices they make are, are incredible. Oh yeah. Uh, You know, they're, they're, I'm fortunate. I'm older. I have, you know, I'm, I'm not well off by any means, but I have, I have resources that I've built up over the years. Um, you know, like a place to sleep that's comfortable, for example. And, and, you know, some of these comedians, I, I, you know, they have, I remember being in my twenties and and not having a great place to sleep and, Mm. and, you know, to, to do that and go out every night to open mics is, is it's impressive. It, yeah. it takes a, a, a strong will. Uh, so. Yeah, I have mad respect for some of these folks. I mean, I know of some Chicago area comics that um, they've got a gym membership and they live in their car. And yeah. and that's that's what they do. They go to the gym every day and shower and um, do their day job, with, which may be Starbucks or whatever, and then they are hitting every mic that they can um, all week. And, yeah. you know, mad respect for that. And um, Yeah, so it's easy for us to complain about being sleepy at 11 p.m., but, yeah. you know, on the side, <laughs> we, have some, we have some things going for us, too. Yeah. I wanted... Uh, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about, um, uh, kind of a point of view thing, you decided, uh, early on, right out of the gate that you were going to be a clean comic and what, what went into that decision and are you glad you made it? You know, what, what goes into that? Yeah. So I, I think honestly, I read an article maybe 20 years ago by Jerry Seinfeld. I think, I mean, I could be misremembering this Mm -hmm. where he basically, the thesis was that if you start, it's harder to write clean comedy, Uh but you make more money doing clean comedy, or or maybe he didn't talk about money. Maybe he just said, you'll be more successful if you do clean comedy. And if you start dirty, it's hard to become clean later. And so basically I just, I just, the message I heard was it's more difficult to be good at clean comedy. Mm -hmm. And it's more difficult to get laughs at clean comedy. And I am a person who really likes a challenge. And so it's already challenging enough to get up in front of a bunch of strangers and tell some jokes you're not sure are any good. But I, I decided early on that I, I wanted to make, uh, I, I want to be successful. And so I heard some advice from some smart, respected comedians that said, you start out clean. And it, and kind of, it's it's not like that's a big stretch for me. I'm not like a very, uh, my, my real life persona is fairly clean. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm not, uh, you know, crazy, uh, person or, you know, um, you know, I like to have fun, but not in any kind of R rated or, you know, crazy, uh, way that would ever offend anybody. Yeah. I don't think, uh, so it's kind of like my natural persona anyways. So I started, uh, doing the clean stuff. And then as I met more comedians and, and some more seasons, comedians who are very generous with their time to maybe have conversations that you could consider mentoring. Uh, many of them revealed to me that the only money they ever really make is through corporate gigs mm. that, that aren't even necessarily stand up comedy. They're more like keynote speaking kind of things. And then they do club work where they barely get paid at all or go do these bar shows. And, but the real money, the way they're paying their mortgage is through corporate events where mm. they have to work clean. Uh, so I kind of learned early on that, and a lot of people say, don't think about money in comedy. And I kind of have mixed feelings about that. Like I, I'm putting a lot of time into this, you know, it's basically a hobby. It's not really a business at this point, mm. but I would, I would like it to become a business. I would like to, you know, I don't ever foresee myself making like Kevin Hart money. Mm. You know, he's making, 
tens of millions of dollars a year. But if I could make fifty thousand dollars a year, uh, that would be incredible. That would be re- and to to do something that I absolutely love. That would be the best thing ever. So I would like to be on a path to in four to eight years be making that kind of money. Mm-hmm. And so I want to I want to look at how do I do that and doing clean. Con- to uh, keep this thing self-sustaining. Now, I will say for the benefit of listeners that I've re- more recently discovered, as I've become a better joke writer, that it is so fun to do not clean material. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and and how you define clean comedy is, is very complicated. But for me, I almost never swear on stage. In, in fact, I'm not sure, I, I'm sure I have two or three times ever in, you know, four or 500 mics Mm -hmm. or stage appearances. Um, But even without swearing, uh, like I have a new joke that uses all, all words that you could express to a kindergartner and they would understand what you were saying. But the joke is about a very complex, dirty topic. Uh And I think it's hilarious. And audiences, they, they also think it's hilarious, but it's also very offensive in some ways. And it, it always gets a reaction and, and it's hard to tell sometimes if that. I kind of. And we cut, uh, we cut out a little joke, bit there. We cut uh, out a little bit there. It's fun to tell a joke like that. Uh, so I've learned that more recently that, that Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, just to re to, to, let me turn off my video for a second. See if that helps any, um, the, uh, yeah, I was just saying that sometimes it's fun to tell not clean material. Right. It's really, it's really fun. I'm the same as you. I'm, I'm, I'm clean. And I rarely swear my, my, in real life, I, use very colorful language. Um, but I, uh, I lead a pretty clean life now, but I do, you know, I do material on my past drug use and, um, uh, sex and stuff like that, but I keep it totally clean. You know, I've, I've got one joke where I, um, say that's a load of baloney. Then I say, sorry for the strong language. And that always gets a laugh. And it's, it, it's, it's harder to do, um, but once you get into that, it's really challenging and fun to find out how to take on um, some more adult topics and make it so that you can say it completely clean. Yeah. One of the things I've, I've been having fun with recently is I start out and do a bunch of very clean material, and then I start searching for that line. And telling these clean jokes that are about more mature topics. Mm-hmm. And it, it's almost funnier because it's coming from me be established that I'm super clean. Right. Uh, and what I like, I haven't figured the, the next step out, which is how you then bring it back to be clean again and, uh, and get laughs. Right. I don't want to minimize the fact that you're not on social media. Um, we, we got into a tangent there and, um, so folks, um, Mark is making a little comedy career for himself and he is not promoting anything on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Uh, and I am on Twitter, just to, it, but barely. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm not on Facebook is the big thing. Yeah. And, and I'm not on Instagram as well, which is owned by Facebook. Yeah. Yeah. So that, you know, um, you, you, you can survive without it. Um, I have, uh, a lot of respect for you for doing that. It's funny. I did a show, um, uh, it was one of the mics I did in Grand Rapids that I hadn't done before. And, um, the last guy that came up, uh, the guy who was announcing, um, said, and, and next up is, uh, Adam and let's congratulate him because he, uh, deactivated his Facebook account <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and everybody cheered for him. So, um, it, it, Facebook's become one of those, one of those things that we think is a necessary evil. That's not that necessary. Yeah. It's a, that's a controversial topic. There are a lot of comedians that think I'm really stupid for not being on Facebook and that I'm hindering 
my comedy career. And I feel like at some point that might be a little more valid. The reality is at this point, a lot of people use Facebook to message show bookers and try and get booked on shows. Yep. And I'm not necessarily at a skill level a year and a half in where I should be bothering showrunners. They're booking people who have been doing comedy five to 10 years. I should keep my head down and focus on the craft and try and get so funny that people just hear about me through word of mouth mm-hmm. and reach out to me, want to find out how to reach me uh, directly. And, and being at an open mic five nights a week, you know, I, I'm seeing all the comedians and if people want to come and this happens, people come up to me and say, Hey, I heard you're not on Facebook. Can I get your phone number, or your email so I can get you on a show sometime? And that's starting to happen, which, which is, feels good to me, but there are a lot of people who, uh, think it's not a good idea. So the jury is still out on it. It's a little <laughs> bit of an experiment. We'll, we'll see how it works in the long run. I will say that for every person that thinks it's a really bad idea, there are people who say, oh, my goodness, I had no idea you could even not be on Facebook. You must be <laughs> such a happy person. Yeah. And, I, and I've never been on Facebook, so I, I don't really understand what happens on there. Uh, but apparently there's a lot of like vile, a bile and, you know, negative drama and <laughs> beefs between comedians and yeah. just a lot of uh the kind of stuff that if it happened in in real life like if i was at a table and people started like i don't know demeaning other people or uh just being really negative i'd come up with an excuse to go you know do something i just say oh, i gotta go get a drink or something like that mm-hmm. and i just excuse in that situation i don't necessarily want to be around that kind of energy so I guess yeah. that's that's a benefit to not being on Facebook. Yeah, you uh, you, you hit the nail on the head, and and it it depends on how you take it um, on on some of these things. Um, the uh, I mean, it can be a crazy um, a, a crazy experience because you know everybody's so divided or whatever. But you know, when I tell you I spend two hours on Facebook a day, most of that is just promoting stuff. So, um, I'm not really reading all the other, all the other junk on there. And, uh, it's not, you know, it's not that big of a deal for me, but I can see how it could really, um, get on people's nerves and, you know, just kind of make their life worse. And who wants that? Yeah, I've definitely talked to some comedians that only use it. They don't consume stuff on Facebook. They only put out information. Right. Um, So that that seemed it does. I mean, it's enormously powerful. The shows that I run, the venues that I have great partnerships with, um, like Silver City Saloon in Aspen and Vail Brewing Company in Vail, Colorado, they have strong Facebook and social media presences. And I'm definitely taking advantage of that and, and using that to my benefit to draw crowds. It's just, it's, it's not my, you know, I pass the information along to the venue in a consistent and orderly manner, and it makes it easy for them to post it on their Facebook and and somehow the people show up. Mm. I also do a lot of stuff with newspapers and other media because I'm not on Facebook. A a funny thing about the Facebook is I, I, one of the reasons I'm not on Facebook is because I'm older. And when it was introduced, I just thought it was a silly idea. And for a long time, people thought that I was dumb for not being on Facebook. But mm-hmm. more recently, the last couple of years, there's been kind of a backlash against social media and just trying to keep up with the Joneses and showing off what you're doing all the time. Yeah. And people have come around to me, people who 10 years ago were like, you know, you're dumb for not being on Facebook have said, you know what, you might have had a, a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I'm coming around to what you're talking about. Or I just deleted my Facebook. You're, you were right. Yeah. Uh, you're doubt it, it's not the best thing ever. You're, you're, uh, you're, you know, a, you're a Facebook trailblazer community. by not, uh, you're, you're a trailblazer by not joining in with the crowd. Yeah, I guess so. And, <laughs> and, and, you know, I don't share on Facebook. I do share quite a bit because you know, I have the book that I wrote. Not good yet. I have a website, markmasters.co. I have a mailing list on that website. You know, I, I have ways that people can hear from me and learn about me. Yeah. Uh, just not on social media, really. Well, let's talk about the mailing list, because I got my first uh, installment of your mailing list uh, where 
you you featured me on it because you talk about your fans on it uh right yeah, near the end well, yeah what a uh what a wonderful mailing list i mean mailing lists tend to be um i've joined them and they tend to be i'm going to be in this city i'm going to be doing this um I'm on this podcast, I'm going to be on this show, blah, 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 and that's all it is. You actually talk about um, stuff in your life, and you, you talk about the, the shows, the good and the bad, and you talk about people you, you've met and stuff like that. It's really, it's, it's really almost like a really nicely written blog article as a newsletter. Yeah, well, it's a, it's a once a month communication to people who are interested in what I'm doing but maybe aren't willing to come to my, come to open mics five nights a week, uh -huh. but still want to get a sense of what's going on. In a lot of ways, if, if people out there have read my book, uh, not good yet, the, the monthly emails are like future chapters of the book. Mm -hmm. So if you, the, the book is about my first six months and first 100 open mics. If you want to know what I'm doing at open mic, you know, around when I hit the 450 open mic milestone, the mailing list is the way to do it. Right. And, and to be totally honest, I, if I write another book, which I probably will do, uh, probably about my first two years of comedy, which will be coming up in June, mm -hmm. uh, I will use the mailing list, uh, the, the, the blog posts as, as you described it, uh, to, to write the outline of the book. It's a way for me to remember what I did and what I felt like at any given time. And it's a lot of some that like you, you just joined for this month, which was a very good email. It was mm. a very positive, uh, good in the sense that I had a lot of positive things happen in comedy for me in the last month. But my December email was a total disaster. Uh -huh. In fact, the title of the email was some, some alliteration around December and a disastrous December, I think is what it was. Uh -huh. Cause like, so many things went wrong and that, you know, I even talked about possibly quitting and, uh, it was, wow. it was a very rough month. Uh, so I try and be as, as honest and transparent about how things are going, uh, because I really want people to feel like they're on this journey with me. Mm. Like, like I said before, there are two, 300 comedians in Denver. It's, it's difficult for me to get people to join the mailing list. Uh, people, obviously don't like email, you know, marketing kind of emails. Mm -hmm. So I might perform in front of, you know, 25 people. Maybe I'm like, a, like sometimes I do book tour type things and I'll talk about my book for, you know, half an hour and I'll sell five copies of it. And I'll ask everybody in the audience, 25 people to join my mailing list. I might even ask people to raise their hand if they will join the mailing list. 10 of them will raise their hand. Mm -hmm. And 12 hours later, zero people will have joined the mailing yeah. list. <laughs> it's a huge uphill battle. I'm yeah. not even up to 100 subscribers yet. I'm getting close to 100 subscribers. Uh -huh. That'll be a big milestone for me when I hit it. I think I'm in the low 80s right now. But it's been really difficult just to get to that number. Mm -hmm. um, and, but I know the people who are subscribed, they do care about what happens with me. Uh -huh. And so... If they're, you know, in a suburb of Chicago and I am going to be there doing a show, there's a good chance they might come out and see me. Yep. And that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to be, it's a very long game. Right. I might run this mail mailing list for another three years and maybe get it up to a thousand subscribers to the point where I can go to Pensacola, Florida, a place I've never been to in my life and where I'm at a co comedic skill level way past where I am now but maybe playing a very small club or a, or, or a small show and actually draw people. That's what I want to do and mm -hmm. get people to tell their friends, Hey, I've been watching this guy for like two years. Here's this. He's going to be something. Uh, but you have a chance to see him in this disgusting bar that you would never go to <laughs> otherwise. Right. <laughs> Let's go watch him. Yeah. And, and that's really, you know, when you talk marketing, getting that thousand true fans is uh, what you want anyway. So 
building building up to that is definitely important. And I just have to stress that um, I'm on mailing lists uh, and I've unsubscribed from lots of mailing lists because they're boring, they're salesy. Yours is not a boring, salesy mailing list. You, you yeah. put your heart into it and it, it really shows. So I, I bet everybody who subscribes and reads one uh, sticks with it. Yeah, well, I have had one unsubscribe. That happened after the December email. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I'm, I'm at 83. I was making it sound like I don't know how many subscribers I have. I do know exactly how many subscribers I have. I have 83 uh -huh. total. And uh, at one point I had, you know, if, if the one person hadn't dropped out, I, I would have had 84. So I'm pretty proud of that ratio. Yeah, that's good. Uh, so, yeah, yeah it's that's... fun. And, and if anybody's interested in the logistics of that, I use a tool called MailChimp. Yep. It's free. You get to 2,000 subscribers, I think, is the way it works, mm -hmm. which is years away for me. And uh, it does take a ton of time. You'd be shocked at how long it took to write that email that you read. Oh, I bet. You know, with all the photos, you got to like upload the photos. And um, I try and it was some of the things I've tried to do to make the emails more engaging is use more pictures and uh, involve the people who are reading the email. Right. So I recently started, I created these stickers for the Vale comedy show. Uh, there are these cute alpaca things. I think mm -hmm. I sent, did I send you one? You did. I, I'm, um, yeah. I've actually got it here and I just got a new whiteboard for my studio and I think I'm going to put it on my whiteboard. So I'll send you I a picture. Send me a picture. So what I've been doing is basically if people send me five bucks through Venmo, I mail them one of these stickers with a personal note. And then they've been sending me pictures of what they did with a sticker, mm. like on a laptop in Seattle or, a, you know, in a, in a green room at, at some club. And then I end up putting it back in the email and people get excited about that. So that's yeah. kind of cool. So I love it if you subscribe to the mailing list, which you can find at markmasters.co uh, and then send me a picture later of, of you reading the mailing list or if you get a sticker or a book or something, that's terrific. Mm -hmm. It's great marketing. I, I know, I know a few people who do that, um, do that sticker thing and it really, it gets exciting for the people who are involved and, uh, it's a, it's a great marketing tool and it's probably something I'm going to pick up for the podcast here too. So Nice. Yeah, look look, look now, for that. Well, I'm not sure if it's great marketing. I think I have sold and mailed four stickers so far. <laughs> so <laughs> I still haven't even paid for the original stickers and uh, I'm certainly not selling out stadiums yet. But if if in 5 to 10 years this all works out, then we can look back and say uh yeah, that that was good. That was smart. Yeah. Mark Mark knew what he was doing. But right now I I really don't know what I'm doing. I'm just kind of guessing and trying to work as hard as I can and yeah. be as humble as I can. Yeah. You're, I mean, you're doing great. Uh, has anybody, uh, actually reached out to you after reading the book, uh, like I did and, um, said, boy, thank you for writing this book. Yeah, for sure. I had uh, somebody, I don't even know, uh, in Florida wrote me a note and said, this was the book I was looking for. Thank you so much. It helped, it's helped me at my open mics. Mm -hmm. And I don't even know how a person heard about the book, which is fun because, uh, you know, on Amazon, I, I have 15 or 16 reviews right now. And I think I know 14 of those people, Yeah, you know, like one of them's a parent of a high school friend, uh, other people are comics that I know personally, you know, I kind of know, or somebody that I met in Chicago on a book tour. Like I know pretty much everybody, a club owner in Arizona that I met, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like I know everybody there. So it's fun when it's somebody that I don't know. Yeah. Um, so that, that's pretty neat. That's neat great. For me. And yeah. Yeah. It's happened. I mean, not, it's not happening every day with different people, but, uh, maybe, 10, 10 people have reached out and said, you know, thanks a lot for putting this together. Mm -hmm. Um, we're getting, uh, we've gone a while here. Um, but there's sure. one thing I really want to, uh, I want to touch on with you, actually a couple things. Um, you were on a, a podcast called I'm not joking, um, with Dr. Peter McGraw 
Yeah. And um, you touched on a subject there that uh, is near and dear to my heart because um, I'll just say I'm a real procrastinator when it comes to writing. And if I don't have something pressing coming up, um, it's really hard for me to carve out time for writing. And in that podcast, you talked about something that you're doing that I think is fantastic. Um, you start your day off with, uh, it's a 20-20-20 thing. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I can. Uh, first off, thank you for doing your research and listening <laughs> to that podcast. It's great. It's an incredible podcast. Neil Brennan's been on it. Uh-huh. Dr. Peter McGraw is an incredible guy. He has a new book coming out on April 1st. I forget what it's called. Uh, it hasn't even really been announced yet, but by the time people listen to this, the book may be out. So check it out. I'm He's actually, also- I'm actually interviewing him next week. Uh, oh, terrific. Awesome. It, it's so cool. fun yeah. because I found you and then I listened to your episode on that podcast and I immediately reached out to him because his first book, the humor code is just it's just a great book. And, um, I did get an advanced copy of the, the next book coming out. So we're going to talk about that too. So, um, it's, that's networking for you, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's a, and, and it's an example of how small the comedy world is. Yeah. I had, a, I had a real quick aside. I had a comedian the other day. We went that theater show that I was talking about earlier. I'd arrived very early, me, him, and another comedian went and got some food. Once we finally got signed up, while we were waiting for the show to start and I didn't know this other comedian very well. And when we sat down to dinner, he was like, Hey, I, I, uh, you don't know me, but I saw you in Boston when you were doing, like I was on vacation in Boston uh-huh. a year ago and I went and did three open mics. He saw me there cause he lived in Boston and he'd recently moved to Denver. And, uh, <laughs> it was just an example of what a small world comedy is. Yes. Uh, they kind of see the same people over and over again yeah, and run yeah. into the same anyway so the 2020 20 thing which uh let me uh, i'll tell you what it is and then we'll have a big reveal at the end yeah uh it was uh 20 minutes of meditation uh 20 minutes uh transcendental meditation which jerry seinfeld is huge on and mm. a lot of comedians swear it's like the secret to unlocking success in life and and in comedy uh, so transcendental meditation, which you can do a nap or, or whatever, mm. uh, 20 minutes of writing, uh, which where I, what I would do is I'd use an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper and a pencil, and I would just write continuously for 20 minutes. It doesn't need to be good. doesn't need to be bad. It's just, you're writing the whole time. And, and in the beginning, my hand would cramp up. It's not easy to physically write for 20 straight minutes. Right. Uh, and I would, I'd usually get to like, I would fill both sides of the page and maybe half of another page usually. Uh, and then 20 minutes of reading, uh, which was very fun. I really enjoyed doing it. I, I hate to admit this, but it stopped not very long after that podcast. Oh, really? <laughs> Basically, <laughs> I went on a vacation and I got out of the habit and I stopped doing it. Uh, I, I aim to do those three things throughout my day still, but I have very mixed results. I was really good about it for a while mm-hmm. and uh, in, in, in full honesty and transparency, I don't do it anymore, but I highly recommend it. <laughs> yeah. It, it inspired me because I, I had tried the meditation thing uh, a few times and I, I felt like a failure. And then my wife was, she's got a, like a meditation app on her phone and what they, it's something that helps you get into the meditative state. And one of the things they said on that app that I heard was it's okay if, um, if thoughts come in or, um, think negative things come in, um, think them out and then just push them away. And I always felt like I failed when I couldn't clear my mind, you know, and, um, and, as you do it, it's like a muscle, obviously you, you work, you work your mind and you, you can get better at it. But I felt like a failure so many times I just walked away from it. And now what you said on that podcast kind of inspired me to get back to that part. And then also the writing part. And, um, so that's one of the things I'm trying to incorporate in my day is, um, I set a lower bar for myself at 10 minutes and sometimes I exceed it, um, but uh, I always try to make sure I do at least the 10 minutes for sure. 
Yeah, maybe maybe that's what I need to do. That's good advice. Lower the bar. Yeah. Do 10, 10, 10. <laughs> uh, I think the other important thing to realize, I'm terrible at the meditation as well. And it's like the writing. Like it could be good, it could be bad. One day I might be good at the meditation. It's okay if I'm not great at the meditation. Yeah. It's like a muscle that you build over time. Right. Well, I think we have an expectation of ourselves that everything we write should be good and something that we, that we can actually turn into a bit. And that's not necessarily the case. No, for sure not. I remember hearing Joe Rogan talk about how he, once he comes up with a premise, he'll write like three to five pages in a Google Doc of just everything. And what he ends up actually using in the bit is, you know, a low percentage points of the total stuff he's thought of. Right. So. Yeah, so it, just the act of, of of writing itself opens up your mind to the good stuff to come in. But if you don't force yourself to write, it's just not going to come to you. So yeah. you, you got, you got to know that maybe 80% of it's not going to be material that you're going to actually develop or um, work with, at least not now. I, you know, I've gone back to stuff that I wrote when I first started and I've actually brought it, uh, I've uh, updated it and brought it into the act and it actually works. So you, you never say never on the stuff you write as well. Yeah, for sure. Go through old joke books, your notebooks and uh, mine for material. Now, now that you're a better comedian, a better writer, you can get those old premises can be, can turn into gold sometimes. Yeah. Definitely. Um, Mark, I just want to say that I think I've only scratched the surface with you. Um, uh, would you be willing to come back on and uh, do another interview at some point? Yeah, of course. I'd love okay. to. That'd be great. <laughs> I like, I like to keep these like less than, less than an hour and a half because I know my, my attention span, I, I can listen to about an hour and a half of a podcast. And when they sure. get into the two and a half hours, I'm like, Oh, like Rogan's podcast, you know, yeah. some of his are marathons. Uh, yeah. you know, I, so I, I like to keep it, keep it short, but I just, I, I just feel like I want to check in with you, um, every once in a while. And even if we don't sit and talk for an hour, I just want to find out how Mark's doing. Um, That's great. And then, well, you're on the mailing list, so yeah. you're going you're gonna to find out anyways, but yeah, we can sit and chat. Yeah. Uh, I, th I, I think you are definitely a uh, complex and engaging person. Um, and you, you would be the person if I was doing an open mic in Denver, I would be drawn to you just because I, I, your, your energy is one of those. I would like, I want to know what he's all about. So I, I feel like I know a little bit about what you're about, but, uh, you know, Obviously, I want to know more. So. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Well, let's stay in touch. And uh, I'm excited. By the way, your podcast, that Tom Dreesen episode, what a get for your very first episode. Oh, I tell you. Um, you know, I, How did that happen? I, you know, one thing I'm not afraid to do is ask. Um, and uh, I've... I've probably reached out to, since I started this podcast, I've probably reached out to um, 30 or 40 people that either didn't answer me or um, gave me a hard no. Um, so, um, but Dreesen was somebody that uh, I, I had uh, interacted with him on Facebook, actually, um, in, a, in a group that's uh, mostly a lot of uh, old comics. And, uh, you know, he's in there, Dobie Maxwell's the guy who started the group, and he's a, he's, he's a little bit older than me, and just a lot, of the, a lot of the old guards on there. And he really was the guy, the, the first comic that I ever noticed, and he's the one that every time I thought about comedy, it was always like, okay, that time I saw you on Mike Douglas, I, you know, that Mike Douglas thing always came up and the fact that I always would search him out and watch him on Carson and stuff like that. Um, so I did get to see him and Valparaiso do his, uh, um, Sinatra show. Cause, uh, uh, if you listen to the episode, he, uh, worked with Frank Sinatra for 14 yeah. years. And, uh, so I saw the show and after the show, my podcast, this podcast was still, an idea. Um, after that show, it was a, I, th I think I had bought the domain and stuff like that, but, um, I hadn't started interviews yet. And I said, I told him there, I said, you know, I'd really like to get you on, on the, uh, podcast. And then he said, yep. Yeah, um, um, 
message me on Facebook and then we'll talk via email. So we did a couple of email things. It really only took a week um, for me to um, get him on after we started talking. And, you know, it's so great when I reach out to these comics, I'm like, yeah, I've talked to people like uh, Tom Dreesen and that's all I really need to say. They're like, Oh, okay. You're legit. So <laughs> nice. yeah. Nice. So, and I, I'm forever in his debt for that. Yeah. That was awesome. I saw him at the laugh factory in Hollywood and he was hilarious. He was really good. Yeah. And he's, you know, he's in his eighties and he's still working on new material. It, yeah. Always. It's crazy. Um, the last thing I want to, uh, talk, to, it's the small world thing. Um, so we, uh, uh, have somebody in common that we know, yeah. uh, Ben Duncan. Uh, he yeah. started, he started out here. He lived up here in Northern Indiana and he moved to Denver and, uh, became one of the people in your circle. Yeah. Hilarious he shows in my book, uh, just as somebody that I, Enjoy, like anytime I see him at an open mic, it makes me happy because I know he's going to make me laugh when he gets up on stage. Yeah. And he's a hilarious, gregarious guy, really loves comedy. I've, I've talked to him after some sets he's done uh, at Comedy Works. And he's just, you know, really his love for comedy is, is really special. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Ben Duncan's a great dude. And, and you sent me a note and asked if he perhaps was from Indiana and he has bits where he talks about Indiana. So yeah. I, I don't know because I can't check on Facebook or anything like that. I'm uh -huh. not like personal close friends with him, but I do know he's told jokes about Indiana. So I'm sure it's the same Ben Duncan. Yeah. Uh, I, I just think that's great. And he's, he's a, uh, he's a very deep intellectual guy too. Um, yeah. I, I miss having him up here because he was one of those guys I had those one-on-one -on -one conversations with. And, uh, I didn't get to know him as much as I wanted to. Cause soon after I met him, you know, he, he moved to the Denver way. And so, you know, it, it, it's, it's bittersweet, but it's really cool to have that small of a world that, you know, I, I stumble across you and then it turns out, you know, we know somebody in common. Yeah. Yeah. He's doing great out in Denver. And it, it's funny what you said about him being smart. It's been a great revelation to me that so many comedians are so intelligent and well read. Like, you know, people telling poop and fart jokes yeah. six nights a week are some of the, the smartest people in, in any circle I've ever been in. Yeah. Uh, I'm very impressed with, with other stand up comics and, yeah. and how cerebral they are. It's not easy to tell jokes. It takes yeah. a kind of person i'm still figuring it out myself yeah i've had some of my deepest uh conversations with comics you know it's yeah. it's really it's and that's that's one of the reasons i keep coming back because you connect with people that uh that really expand uh your your knowledge and also you can help them out by what you know so it's a it's a lot of you know all of them aren't like that some of them are a little bit more standoffish but the ones that you can really connect with it's really um an added benefit to doing stand-up comedy so a uh, quick challenge for your listeners scott i'm not on facebook but you can find a pretty easy way to send a note to me through my website. If you do that uh, and you're nice, I'll, it's the first couple of people. I'll mail you an Alpaca Veil Comedy Show sticker. Three-inch die cut. They're yeah. beautiful. They're terrific. Uh, you'll want one. So uh, yeah. send me a note. Say hello. Say, say Scott sent you. And uh, I'll mail you a sticker. Yeah. that And uh, th that let me know how that goes for you. Um, the book is called Not Good Yet by Mark Masters. You can get that directly from Mark from his website, or you can get it on Amazon. Um, you can get it on Audible, and Mark narrates it. Um, you're a good narrator, by the way. Thanks. Um, the next time we talk, I really want to... Yeah. Really, anybody out there, if they want advice, I learned a lot the hard way narrating that book. Yeah. So uh, shoot me a note. I'd be happy to pay it forward and share that knowledge with anybody who's recording an audio book. Right. Uh, it, was, it was fun, but it was also a struggle. Mm -hmm. I, and I just got to say, this book is great for anyone who is thinking about getting into comedy and doing the open mics, but it's also good for those of us who have been doing it because, um, you know, I learned things from it, but it also, um, it, it makes me understand that I have kindred spirits out there that, that have gone through the same things I have. And just reading the book, it, it brings some comfort to somebody like me too. So right. it's, it's good yeah. for everybody. 
Yeah, I like to tell people, even people who aren't into comedy, anybody who's into reaching for a goal or a dream, it's, it's a good story of, yeah. of failure and success and failure. But yeah. I, I, <laughs> it's I, I a humbling could, story. Yeah. Are you on Amazon yet, Scott? Yeah. I'm going to you publicly here. You can have... Uh, I, I have not done the, the review yet, um, but I have um, clicked on the uh, on your book page and started to do it. And then I have a real job and I got uh, <laughs> I, I got interrupted. So um, yeah, it's yeah, going to happen. Now, make sure you leave a review as well. I appreciate it. Yeah. Every little bit. Helps. And in the show notes, folks, I'll have a link to Mark's website uh, so you can go right right there and get on the mailing list, which you should. And um, you can get his book from there. And I'll also put the Amazon link up, too, to make it easier. And maybe the Audible link if, if that works for me, too. So it's all going to be there. All right. Mark, Thanks, thank Scott. you, thank really you so fun. much for being on the podcast. Uh, like I said, you were one of those guys that I ran across, and I'm like, this is the perfect guy for this podcast. Terrific. Great. Thanks a lot. Have a great day. Thank you. Have a good one. Holy cow, that Mark Masters interview was fantastic. I'm really glad I got a hold of him. I learned a lot, and I hope you did too. Now's the time to leave a review. You can uh, hit me up over at iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts and do that review. The reviews are important so that we can climb up the charts and people will find us and listen to us. It's also time to tell your friends. Tell your friends that the Behind the Bits podcast is something to listen to if you are into comedy. Also, follow me. Twitter, the BTBPC. That's how you find me, at the BTBPC. Facebook, Behind the Bits Podcast, just type it in the search bar. Instagram, Behind the Bits Podcast, just type it in the search bar. And my new YouTube channel, Behind the Bits Podcast, just type it in the search bar. My YouTube channel has some of my comedy up there, so you can uh, check that out and review my comedy and tell me how bad I am or how good I am. Check that out because there's going to be more content up there. Also, uh, you can shoot me an email. If you don't want to do the social media thing, shoot me an email, scott at the btbpc.com. If you are interested in being a guest or you just have some feedback for me, I'll take positive or negative. Thanks for listening. When it's time for an adventure on the open highway, one quick call to American Family Insurance gets you headed in the right direction. Our travel peace of mind package is there if you encounter a bump in the road. From roadside assistance to rental car coverage, we have you covered. Find a local agent or get a quote at amfam.com. American Family Insurance. American Family Mutual Insurance Company, SI, and its operating company, 6000 American Parkway, Madison, Wisconsin.